it is amazing the type of strength we can find inside of us if you want to succeed in this life you must fight against the spirit that tells you this cannot work you look here impossibility impossibility written everywhere except god helps you you can toil and toil but when god visits you and you experience divine encounter he changes your whole world the day you were conceived there were millions of potential human beings you were fighting with and you defeated all of them. You were born a winner. Tonight, the message I'm bringing is titled The Mean and the Noble. The Mean and the Noble. Father, tonight, I just depend on your grace. The situation has been disorienting, tormenting to the mind and to the brain. At this time, oh God, help me as I share your word with your people. Do not send us away empty. But bless your people tonight in Jesus' name. To be mean means to be very unkind, cruel, and vicious. Can you imagine somebody traveling and there was an accident? People in the vehicle with hands broken, face smashed hips dislocated, legs broken, and you saw villagers rushing out, and you were rejoicing that help was coming. And all of a sudden, they are searching you and taking your money. And they saw a baby flung out as the vehicle was from assaulting. And they just take your baby and run away and they are going to use him or her for sacrifice. That is what meanness is all about. Totally unwilling to help, but making people's situation even worse. But to be noble is to be of high moral quality. It means to be deserving praise, honor, and being unselfish. You can develop meanness without even being conscious of it. But to be noble is something you have to consciously and willingly decide that that is what you want to make your lifestyle to be. We don't know people when things are normal. But wait until when situation becomes so there, then you get to know people around you. Robert McKee said, true character is revealed in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. It is when pressure comes and when the pressure is intense, that is when you know the stuff people are made of. Think of me and a masculine person, tall and huge, we are traveling across the Sahara and we lost, we couldn't find our way. People get lost in Sahara Desert often. We have food that can last us for three days and this fellow traveling with me is the person holding the pistol, the gun we are holding for protection. 
We don't know if it will take us two weeks, three weeks to find our way. And he looks at the food. If two of us start eating it, we'll soon finish it. And he retreats to the back. Points the pistol to my head and blows my head off. Because he wants the food to last. Since he doesn't know how many days or weeks it will take him to find his way. The relationship between Saul, the king of Israel, and David was that of father and son. Harmony and peace we are reigning. One day, Saul took the army of Israel to the battlefield and David had returned to his father to take care of the flock. The father said, go to the battlefield and see how your brothers are faring. While there, Goliath of God, the champion of the Philistines, showed up. He was a very mighty bully. He was threatening, he was boasting, he was intimidating Israel. And David remembering how he handled a lion and a bear and how he killed them, he went to Saul and he was granted permission. David slew Goliath and jealousy rose. It takes only very few people with sound character to resist jealousy when you kill the champion no other person can kill. Many friends become enemies. So think twice before you attempt killing a giant. When David did that, the women were moved. They felt no one else had done this type of exploit. They composed a song and sang. He said, Saul had killed his thousands, but David, his ten thousands. That was when that jealousy rose. And it became very clear what a mean man Saul was. For him, it was like this had become survival of the fittest. It is either that I kill this boy or he kills me. At the end, only one person must shine. There is no way that I will be contesting for prestige and honor with this small boy. So quickly rearranged his priorities. He selected 3,000 specially trained soldiers, the elite troop. The charge was, find the son of Jesse, bring him to me, dead or alive. And a day came, as they were moving from mountain to valley, climbing rocks, getting into caves, into bushes, name it, looking for David. One day they were closing in. And the Bible said, A mighty sleep from God fell upon Saul and his soldiers. 
they were lying like corpses. David and his boys came close. And Abishai, one of his commanders said, my Lord, this is the day the Lord said to you, he will put your enemies to become your footstool. Hallelujah. Amen. Permit me, I will, I will just pin him to the ground once. And our suffering will end. David resisted it. The second day, it was that David and his men we are hiding in a cave, perhaps resting. And unbeknown to Saul and his men, they were passing through the same routes. As they go to the mouth of the cave, something happened to the tummy of King Saul. The version of the Bible read, said he went in to cover his feet. You know, when you are wearing big gown and you are squatting, the gown covers your feet. That was King James' way of describing it. He went, Americans will say he went to use the bathroom. That's a confusion. Americans don't call toilet, toilet. If you mention the word toilet, everybody will frown. So if you are in UK, you call it toilet. If you are in US, you call it bathroom. And it's so confusing. I go from here to here. And you're thinking, what should I say now? <laughs> so he was using the toilet. David rose, sneaking around and got to him. He couldn't hear it until the hem of his garment was caught. He allowed him to go. And after he had gone for a distance, David climbed a hilly place and he started shouting, My father, my father, who was it that told you that David is seeking after your life? If it is God that told you that, may he receive sacrifice. But if men told you that, it's not going to be well with them. Can a man find his enemy and let him go? My father, look at this. This is a piece of your garment. And I was advised by some that I should end your life today. But God forbid that I should put my hand upon you. God's own anointed. Hallelujah. Listen to me. You will survive all the odds against you in this life in Jesus' name. Yeah. You cannot die until God had endorsed it. Yeah. Look at the testimony I shared on Sunday. Not my testimony, but Dr. Magdalene Irosuros. You came to the motor park late or early in the evening and the vehicle you want to take from McCordy to Joss was full and they were waiting for two passengers. Our sister came out and they accepted him, accepted her. Shortly after that, two passengers came and they say, Madam, get down. We want to take these two people and move. And our sister stepped out. Decided, I'll go back to Boko, spend the night with my sister. Tomorrow, I continue the journey because it's, it's running late. Only for that vehicle to take off. And on the way, was involved in such accident that it was smashed and all the people died. He took some other people who knew her because she went to Asaba to represent female doctors of Plateau State in a conference. 
and decided, let me go through Benue and see my sister. He took some other people who went after that vehicle had depart departed to call her and to say, the vehicle you were to travel in, all your co-passengers, as it were, they are dead. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Who else can do such miracle? You know, you will say accidentally. Uh, fortunately. Coincidentally. There is no coincidence when it comes to the life of a believer. And those people, we are dead. Our sister is still alive. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I don't know how many of you who know Jen. She shared a testimony once. She went to Feringa, the market. Was standing by the roadside. Got to a place. Standing by the roadside. Thinking, of, do I go here or do I go here? And all of a sudden, there was this impression. Cross this road. Cross this road. Go to the other side. And she just crossed. Shortly after she had crossed, a trailer that was coming diverted and crushed all the people standing with her. I thought somebody would shout hallelujah. He said, I will give nations for you. The Lord said, it will come, you will see with your eyes, but it will not come near you. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Because her day of death had not come. David was in God's hand. And when you are in the hand of God, you are virtually indestructible. He was in God's hand. But we are now in a better place. The Bible said, in him we live and move and have our being. As you see me here, I am right inside the stomach of God. In him we live. And in him we move. We are enclosed inside God. So before anybody can touch me, <laughs> you have to touch the Son of God first before you can reach me. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. So it is the same God David served that we are serving. So relax. Don't be moved because of many things against you. God will never leave you just in the mercies of those seeking your life. Those seeking your downfall, if any, they will see you rising. Yeah. Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The Pharaoh pursuing you will end up in the Red Sea. Yeah. God's plan is to take you to the promised land and to have you established there. Only those who disobey will perish in the wilderness. The Joshua's, the Caleb's who hear him and obey him, they will make it to the end. Amen. In every generation, you find the mean, you find the noble. In every society, you find the good, you find the bad. At the fall of man, every goodness God put into man kind of drained away. From then, Nobody becomes noble except you take conscious steps to be, nice, to be a nice person. 
meanness stems out of the quest to be alone and to eat alone. It is out of the hunger of using everybody around you and flourishing while they perish. But the men should understand that God did not create us to be load rangers. He didn't create us just to be alone. God saw Adam. He was alone. All the animals around him, miserable man. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. God created a wife for him. And after creating him a wife, God went further. He said, increase and multiply and fill the whole earth. Two of you are not enough. I want you to increase. I need, you need more human beings around you. So from the onset, God wanted us to be many and he created us to be gregarious. We should be moving around, milling around. The purpose of that was for friendship, association, and mutual help. The doctor, medical doctor, needs the mechanic to fix his car. He needs the plumber to connect water to the house. He needs the electrician to take care of electrical issues in his house. He needs the furniture man to make bed and other items of furniture for him. He needs a farmer for his food. In the same vein, all these people I mentioned, they need a doctor for their health. Childbearing stems out of the same concept. Isaac was Esau's father. As a father, Isaac was providing for Esau. But at a point, the story changed. Esau, whom his father was going out to bring food and feed, look at what the Bible said in Genesis 25, 28. Isaac loved Esau because of the wild game he was providing for him. Now, it is no more Isaac providing for Esau, it is Esau providing for Isaac. Positions have been swapped. Esau became the one feeding Isaac. In Genesis 45, from verse 9 to 11, Joseph said to his brothers, hurry and go up to my father and say, thus says Joseph your son, God has made me Lord of Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in Goshen. You shall be near me. There I will nourish you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look at little David. You are now the one to nourish your father. Can somebody shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Can somebody shout a bigger Hallelujah. That's what our children do for me and my wife now. Wherever I go to preach, our son, Nathaniel, tries to beat the odd to come to hear me preach. Not just to hear me, to support me. And I often tell the people, this is our father now. Hallelujah. I live in his house. I eat his food. I drive his cars. I'm sick. He takes me to hospital. He pays the bill. He does everything I used to do for him. And he does more. Hallelujah. He does more. 
That's why my heart goes out to the childless people. If anybody is childless here, may God remember you in Jesus' name. We hope this message has inspired you. Thank you for watching. To other for this message, please call 080 God bless you.